Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B. And today we're here to talk about God's judgment and what we can do to prepare for that. Um, first of all, I have a story for you. Uh, we're calling today's story. This is a story about, uh, well, it's a story about a what we call a native or a natural uh, corner of our property. We leave one corner of our property uh, completely untouched. We've never done anything to it. And that's for the benefit of our wild quail, uh, wild rabbits, uh, birds, and all kinds of critters live in there. And that's, that's great. We're fine with that. Uh, it's a little bit of habitat uh, for them. Now, on the edge, uh, way out there on the edge of the native or wild corner of our property uh, is our woodshed. And that's an out-of-the-way place. Uh, during the cold, wet months of the year, the path from our house to the woodshed is well-worn because we heat with wood. However, it hasn't been cold or wet for a very long time. It's the middle of the summer. Now, yesterday, I brought home another truckload of firewood, and I realized it's time to get organized. It's time to start cleaning the, out the old woodshed, uh, getting out a lot of the old stuff, uh, some of the stuff we've collected over the winter, the old big rounds, the, the big logs, get them out of there. Uh, start stacking uh, burnable firewood for this winter. Um, and we have a lot of stuff piled outside that needs to be split, and we're gonna have more stuff. Um, However, there is a problem, or there was a problem. Um, the path to the woodshed was knee deep in grass and weeds, and the berry vines and the thistles were shoulder deep. I couldn't get to it. So, last night I had to get busy with the uh, loppers and the lawnmower. Uh, to clear the path out to the woodshed. We'll see how that works out in just a minute. First, though, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have cleared the way for all who will come to you and enjoy your presence. Thank you that you exercise judgment based on your perfect wisdom our first reading for today is from the book of Joel. Um, we're going to read from my new favorite Bible. Uh, my daughter Christina got me this, the King James Giant Print. And we're just going to read the first four verses of Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell you your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, that which the palmer worm hath left the locust eaten hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left the canker worm hath eaten and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar hath eaten okay now we got a quote for you today today's quote is from ch or charles haddon spurgeon a.k.a. the people's preacher. And he says, I believe certain doctrines because God says they are true. And the only authority I have for their truth is the word of God. I receive such and such doctrine not because I can prove them, to be compatible with reason, 
not because my judgment accepts them, but because God says they are true. Now, this is one of the best services we can re render to God, to submit ourselves to him in our belief of what he has revealed and ask him to fix his truth in our hearts and make us obey them. Now we got a reading for you from the Amplified Study Bible. And we're in Joel. Study Bible, by the way, is a good thing. If you don't have a study Bible, you might want to get one. Um, they have notes. Okay. Um, Joel chapter 1, 5 through 20. Awake from your intoxication, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the fresh sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a pagan and hostile nation has invaded my land like locusts, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, an object of horror. The splintered and, and splintered and broken my fig tree. It has stripped them completely bare and thrown them away. Their branches have become white. Wail like a virgin bride clothed with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth who has died. The daily grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is ruined. The ground mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new, vine, the new wine is dried up. The fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers. Wail, O ye vine dressers. For the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up and the fig tree fails. The pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, joy dries up and withers, or sorry, withdraws from the sons of men. Clothe yourselves with sackcloth and lament. Cry out in grief, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth with prayer. And pray without ceasing, O ministers of my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord in penitent pleadings, Alas for the day, for the judgment day of the Lord is at hand, and it will come upon the nation as a destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off from before your eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds of grain shrivel under the clods. The storehouses are desolate and empty. The barns are in ruins because the grain is dried up. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are bewildered and wander aimlessly because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. O Lord, I cry out to you, 
for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant in longing for you, for the water brooks are dried up and fire has consumed the pastures of the wilderness. Okay. Now, if you don't already have something to drink, maybe a snack, if you don't already have a Bible, I might run and run and get a Bible and follow along with us today. Uh, but first, we have a definition from Nelson's new illustrated Bible dictionary. And today's word is, or the first word of today is judgment. Now, I'm only reading a very small part of this because they go on, on and on as well they should about judgment. Um, but I'm just going to read this one little section that says, The final judgment has been anticipated throughout history in a series of judgments brought by God upon the wicked. The whole world was affected by the flood and by the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel. The heathen nations, such as the Egyptians and the Canaanites also experience God's judgments. Just as God's people, the Israelites, did when they persisted in rebellion. These judgments serve as a continual warning of the consequences of unbelief. The death of Jesus Christ is unique among these judgments of history. Through his death, God paid the judgment price demanded by humankind's sin. The death and resurrection of Jesus are the foundations on which sinners are saved through their trust in him as Lord and Savior. Okay. Now we have an analogy. Um, I was listening to some of our teachers and expositors this week, and I ran across this analogy, and I think it's just perfect for what we're talking about today. Um, there's certainly a lot of work involved in boxing up everything at the old house and unpacking everything at the new house. Now, this analogy is called moving day. As the story was relayed to me, this gentleman had his alarm set for 6 a.m. in the morning on moving day. But he woke up at 4.30 and could not go back to sleep. Before five in the morning, his young son ran into the room and shouted, It's moving day! Daddy, aren't you excited? The little boy said. Well, certainly there was a big difference in the perspective of the man and his young son. This is a good analogy for judgment. We can look at and focus on all the troubles and tribulation that the world is certainly going to go through and is going through right now. Or we can look at the certain outcome of this judgment guaranteed by our perfect Savior, the Lord Jesus, and by the prophets and the apostles speaking and writing the truth of the Holy Bible on the authority of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now we have a reading from the New Living Translation. And this is a study Bible. And we've got, I've got a little note for you. Uh, we're in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. 
Raise the alarm on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear, because the day of the Lord is upon us. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. Suddenly, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears. Nothing like it has been seen before or will ever be seen again. Fire burns in front of them and flames follow after them. Ahead of them, the land lies as beautiful as the Garden of Eden. Behind them is nothing but desolation. Not one thing escapes. They look like horses. They charge forward like war horses. Look at them as they leap along the mountaintops. Listen to the noise they make like the rumbling of chariots, like the roar of fire sweeping across a field of stubble, or like a mighty army moving into battle. Fear grips all the people. Every face grows pale with terror. The attackers march like warriors and scale city walls like soldiers. Straight forward they march, never breaking rank. They never jostle each other. Each moves in exactly the right position. They break through defenses without missing a step. They swarm over the city and run along its walls. They enter all the houses, climbing like thieves through the windows. The earth quakes as they advance, and the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord is at the head of the column. He leads them with a shout. This is his mighty army, and they follow his orders. The day of the Lord is an awesome, terrible thing. Who can possibly survive? That is why the Lord says, Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Okay, so we have a little note here on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an important theme among the prophets. Joel uses it, uses it five times in his short book. And six other prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi, use the exact expression, while others... Obadiah and Jeremiah refer to it in, a slightly, in slightly different words. It originally meant any decisive divine intervention in history, but gradually became associated with the last great day when God would intervene once and for all and establish his kingdom in all its fullness. <clears throat> The day of the Lord had two key aspects. The first was judgment. God would intervene on Israel's behalf and judge the nations for their wickedness, shaking even creation itself. But while God's people looked forward to that day, 
believing it would bring their vindication, the prophets warned that unless they repented, they too would be part of that judgment along with everyone else. As Amos said, What sorrow awaits you when you say, If only the day of the Lord were here. You have no idea what you are wishing for. But the day of the Lord wouldn't just be a day of judgment. It would also be a day of hope. The day when God would restore his faithful people and establish his reign over the whole earth through Israel's Messiah. Since the prophets linked the day of the Lord with the Messiah's coming, it was natural for Jesus and the early church to associate it with his return at the end of the age. The preoccupation of the New Testament is not, like so often today, with when that day would be, but rather with the importance of being ready for it and being active in the Lord's work in the meantime. Okay. Judgment is certain, being ordained by God. What can we do to prepare? Now, for the purposes of this class, we're going to define the word preparation as something done to get ready for an event or the action or process of making something ready for use or service or of getting ready for some occasion, test, or duty. Now, we have some synonyms. I'm going to try it again. Oh, there we go. Synonym time. Uh, synonyms for preparation. Foresight. Arrangement. Provision. Readying. Anticipation. Alertness. Expectation. Or putting in order. Now, we have some antonyms for preparation. <clears throat> Carelessness. Heedlessness inattention, negligence, and unreadiness. I have another reading for you. Uh, this is our last reading for the day. Uh, this time is from Joel chapter 3. We're just going to read verse 9 through 16. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare, prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And some of you know that valley as the Valley of Armageddon. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full, and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion. 
and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. I got a little note here for you. The last word will be God's. His ultimate sovereignty will be revealed in the end. We cannot predict when the end will come, but we can have confidence in his control over the world's events, the world's history, as well as our own pilgrimage is in God's hands. We can be secure in his love and trust him to guide our decisions. Okay, we got a little bit of a class roundup for you. It is not for us to know all things. We must have faith in God. God knows all things. One of our favorite words in this class is omniscient. Since God is omniscient and we are learning to trust him more and more each day, ask yourself this question. What can I do to prepare my heart for the proper and right judgment of God? Has the relationship between me and God become like the path to the woodshed in summer, overgrown by weeds, berry vines, and thistles? What can we do to prepare our hearts to accept the appropriate and much-needed judgment of God? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord that your judgment is right. Help us to prepare our hearts, we pray. Bless the reading of your word for each of us this week, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a good week.